Hey folks, I'm Alex Dowd. And I'm Katie Rice. On today's show, we're reporting on the 2021 Sundance Film Festival, which just wrapped up a couple of days ago. Katie and I will discuss some of the biggest and best films to premiere at this uniquely virtual edition of the annual event, and how it compares to a quote-unquote normal year at the fest. Welcome to Film Club. So welcome, folks, to another episode of Film Club. Uh, we are talking today, uh, as we mentioned up top, about the Sundance Film Festival, which uh, happens every January. Uh, Katie, how you doing? I'm doing pretty all right. How are you doing, Dad? Oh, it's, I'm good. Uh, snowed in. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Uh, so normally, uh, we, we don't normally uh, discuss film festivals too much on this show, or we, we didn't mm-hmm. in the past because uh, it was kind of difficult to to make that happen. Uh, I, I feel like right. be- before the year of the pandemic, uh, we you know the show was almost purely a video show, and um, mm-hmm. it was it, it would it would require uh, sort of bringing a whole video crew along to to the festivals because we'd actually be there in person, and. Um, I feel like we 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 played with that once. We did that one year when it was me and Ignati, and uh, but for the most part, um, because this is now a podcast, we can now we can now report from the fest, and we can do and mm-hmm. and uh, because of the pandemic, uh, we're sort of uh, covering these film festivals from our homes. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that's another big thing. Is I mean we could do this in person at a film festival, right? Like, oh yeah, for podcast sure. Podcast equipment isn't too. Um, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, have to like throw a blanket over a, over a, <laughs> over the table at a at an Airbnb or something. Yeah, you know? right. Yeah, sit in the bathtub. <laughs> yeah, sit in the bathtub of a hotel. Exactly, <laughs> hotel room. But yeah, uh, like you said, it's a virtual edition. So I think this is probably, in terms of like logistics, this is about as easy as doing a podcast about a film festival gets, right? <laughs> yeah, and and honestly, it's also about as easy in some respects as a film festival gets. You know, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, uh, you and I have both attended our fair share of film festivals and um, there's a lot of runaround with them. You know, right. I mean, you sort of spend a lot of your time uh, racing from one from one screening to the next and trying to fit in. Uh, you know, you, you try to fit in time to eat when you can you sort of wolf down a slice mm-hmm. of pizza, you know, in the, the mm-hmm. 22 minute pocket you have between two movies sometimes. Hope they have uh, snacks at the after party. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You try to find, you know, uh, you, it's basically, it's, it's a game of, it's almost a game of Tetris with your schedule mm-hmm. when you do a film mm-hmm. festival. And yeah. And sometimes at a festival, you know, like when they have the, uh, the critics screenings before, you know, the day properly starts, like sometimes those start at like 8 a.m. And then if you do, you know, if you really want to go hardcore, you can see like six or seven movies in a day if you start with the 8 a.m. and go until the midnight slot. But like, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I never recommend that. I mean, when people ask me like what you know, when there's curiosity about a film festival, like what is the most number of movies you've seen in a day? I have maxed mm-hmm. out at six, and I think that's too many because honestly, yeah. I think at a certain point it's almost unfair to the movies because well, yeah, you can't keep them all straight. No, after a while you can't, and I think it gets kind of unfair to those later movies because I don't know about you, but by my sixth movie, I am starting to actually, even as somebody who loves movies and loves film festivals, and 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 would spend, if left to his own devices, a lot of his free time watching movies, mm-hmm. I I start to kind of resent movies by the sixth movie. <laughs> I'm like, why am I still sitting and doing this? You're you know? like, why? You're yeah. questioning your life choices. <laughs> yeah, you need a little bit of balance, you know. Um, um, but the, the, these virtual editions, I mean, you and I covered the Toronto International Film Festival mm-hmm, in mm-hmm. September. Uh, readers can look back and, and, and they can listen to that episode as well, where we talked about some of, some of the highlights of that fest. Um, covering a virtual edition is different in a lot of ways, simply because you lose, I mean, really, you lose so much. It, it, it takes a film festival, which is so many things, mm-hmm. really. It's a, it, a film festival is a social event. It is a networking opportunity. It is a cultural event. It, it, you know, for me, it's always felt a little bit like camp. And that's especially true at Sundance because, 
Um, I've been going to this fest for almost a decade now, and mm-hmm. I have been sort of bunking with the same people for many, many years with a group of Chicago critics. And we uh, we sort of stay in a condo that's a lot like a cabin, sort of. And it sort of feels like going to camp a little bit. And, um, you know, you see people you have not seen in a year or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have these regular places that you go to that, that you see once a year or something. Like, I have a special place yeah. at Sundance. This There's this bagel shop that I really like to write at mm-hmm. at, at, at Sundance um, that I found myself missing this year. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. When people talk about Sundance specifically, they're always like, I miss the Chase Bank. And you're like, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> By the way, like Park City, I mean, I really enjoy going to Sundance every year, but Park City is uh, not a, it's not a foodie town. Mm-hmm. And uh, you are very lucky if you could, if you get a very good meal when you were in Park City. I mean, I mean, oh my I, God, I, yeah. I feel like I'm offending, probably going to offend somebody who's from there who's like, oh, you just haven't found the hidden gems of the town. But they don't want you to know, man. I, yeah. I can only imagine what it's like living in Park City. Like, like the only thing that's even close to it that I can imagine is my college town was sort of a destination for Halloween parties and like thousands of people would descend on the town for a Halloween party and it was uh you know you're in college so of course you're like this is awesome but I can only imagine now that I would hate every single person that came in from out of town (laughs) so like I can only imagine what it's like to live in a town like Park City because it's got to be very sleepy the rest of the time yeah, I mean, I, the impression I get is that it is, yeah, it's basically like kind of a sleepy mountain town that for two weeks mm-hmm. out of the year turns into an insane tourist destination. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you're getting every year in January, you're getting um, really thousands of people coming into this town and, um, you know, movie producers, uh, movie critics, movie stars, Uh, just just tons of people and then uh, of course people who come there simply for the parties because Sundance even more than than I think maybe the average film festival Mm -hmm. is such a party festival in the sense that people will go there there's a whole stretch um in uh in downtown uh Park City called it's it's called Main Street it's like their historic street and it's just a line of bars and galleries and restaurants and it's um it's very much every night of Sundance it's like the most hop in place in the world you know like <laughs> yeah just it really um is this would you say this is true i always got the impression that sundance was like one of the more hollywood festivals like everyone from hollywood comes out yeah well i mean that, i think that it, it is and i think that that has to do both with its proximity to los angeles because you know it's mm-hmm. obviously it's in utah and it's that's not too far from la and with the kind of movies that play there and right okay I think we could talk for ages about the way that this festival has changed over the years and how how it began, which was as a genuinely independent festival, and mm-hmm. how over the years how, how that changed so that now I mean there are there are genuinely independent movies that play there and we're gonna talk about at least at least a couple of them today. Sure, yeah. Um, but also <laughs> it becomes kind of this destination for Indiewood Fair, for the mini majors. Yeah, um, I was gonna that's why I chuckled. I was like, Well, you know, it's all relative what's an indie, right? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. You know, when you're talking a movie that costs $5 million or $10 million, I don't know, like, how much, like, the word indie becomes a little bit more nebulous mm-hmm. there, you know? I mean, which, of course, $10 million is um, is nothing compared to what the average studio movie now costs. It's it, like, it's, right, it's totally. A drop but in it's the still, bucket. like, but it's still, like, you don't make $10 million on Kickstarter. You know right, what exactly. I mean? It's, 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 yeah, it's yeah. this middle ground. Yeah. Totally. So, yeah, it, it um, Yes, I would agree that it is. Uh, it's a very Hollywood film festival. Mm, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's part because it's such a buying spree there too. I mean, this year, I, I, I think a new a new record was set this year um, for acqu- really? acquisitions. Yes, um, the movie virtually, Co- huh? Yeah, yep. The movie Coda, which was uh, on, o- which actually premiered opening night of the festival. Um, it's about uh, the old, uh, a young woman, a teenager who uh, wants to become a singer, and she is the lone hearing member of a family, uh, everyone else of whom is, is deaf. Um, it's uh, We're not going to talk too much about that film today. I, I saw it on opening night. I wrote a little bit about it in my first dispatch. It's um, All I'll say about it is that it, it very much has been engineered to be a crowd pleaser. There are some very authentic mm-hmm. things about it, and then there are some things about it that feel... I think it was David Fear uh, at Rolling Stone who said that um, it's very time efficient because if it basically packs five different prototypical Sundance movies into one movie, <laughs> so so it kind well, of makes let's, sense let's, that it got paid that much. 
for it. But well, that's in a, that. Well, okay, that leads us to another interesting thing to talk about, which is what is a prototypical Sundance movie? Because it is kind of. It, it, it's a descriptive term. Like, it's a useful descriptive yeah. term. That's kind of changed over the years, uh, too, honestly. Um, and I do think that sometimes people... Uh, th- I mean, the reality is that Sundance itself programs, you know, a, a ton of movies every single year. And you are going to get a wide spectrum of films, including ones that are that are truly radical. But I think when people talk mm-hmm. about the prototypical Sundance film, what they mean is a kind of... Um, a kind of warm and fuzzy crowd pleaser, uh, usually sort of, sort of, often kind of whimsical or quirky. Uh, precious is another word that 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 comes to mind when we <laughs> think about that. Um, they're the, uh, often these kind of dramedies. Um, they may star SNL alums who are sort of moonlighting as uh, moonlighting in serious roles. Um, I, I think it, it, it sort of uh, it sort of connotates a certain um, a certain cutesiness. Yeah, like, was it Little Miss Sunshine, a Sundance yes, movie? Yes, It's and kind I, of the prototypical y- Sundance movie. Exactly. Sort of the ultimate Sundance movie as we understand that now. And and, and also, mm-hmm. I mean, like, Little Miss Sunshine is what everyone is chasing every single year, in a way. Because mm-hmm. that movie sold for a lot of money, and then it made a shit ton of money when it when it yeah. came to theaters. It was So every year, you'll see, you'll see a distributor come to Sundance, pick up a movie for a ghastly amount of money... And then often, more often than not, I would say it goes bust. Uh, it'll open. They often open in the summer, and then you know they just aren't a, a, as big of a hit um, yeah. off the mountain as they were on it, so to speak. Yeah, I'm thinking about me and Earl and the Dying Girl. Yes, it's kind Another of an example, great example of that. Yeah. yeah. People talk about altitude sickness a lot when when, when covering <laughs> Sundance, and the idea that I think there is a genuine theory that people are. That, that some of the reactions at a Sundance, which tend to be people are almost sort of racing to have the most glowingly positive reaction, mm-hmm. o- like often um, people sort of uh, people sort of ascribe that possibly to to a certain lightheadedness that people have walking around to the Park City. But, <laughs> well, um. certainly um, a lot of times when you hear a story about, oh, the, oh, this is something you hear specifically in horror movies marketing is this movie so extreme it made people pass out and barf. And yeah. a lot of the times uh, the incident in question was at Sundance and you could honestly blame altitude sickness for you that. T- you very much <laughs> could, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> people are just genuinely sick. I mean, I get a headache every year. Yeah. I'll say it's the one thing I yeah. really enjoy about doing this virtually is that I do not, I'm not getting the altitude sickness. <laughs> <laughs> Well, also, it seems like it's a lot of, um, uh, I mean, this is the first time that I've uh, really uh, participated in Sundance. Uh, It seems like there's a lot of waiting outside in the cold, too. Like, I've never envied that. I always thought that sounded kind of miserable. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, um, I'll say this. Uh, They mostly, it's mostly tented. So mm-hmm. um, you're not uh, standing in f- the frigid Utah weather directly, at least. Mm-hmm. You are inside of a tent. Um, so that helps a little bit. Um, it's It also sort of depends on what badge you have. I know that um, right. if you don't have the highest badge, you will, and this is true of, of, of the Cannes Film Festival as well, and, and, and of a lot of film festivals, I think, you, you will spend uh, a, a decent chunk of your time waiting outside if it's anything that people are super excited to see and you know i i hear yeah, horror sure. stories about this i remember the year the witch premiered and there were multiple screenings and people were getting shut out of every one because they just did not have the capacity and people would show up an hour and a half in advance and then still not get in or something you know yeah like even at a festival you know like something uh uh specialty like fantastic fest there's definitely overflow lines and things like that oh yeah for sure uh so what what is your what has been your experience cut uh Kind of covering it um, virtually. Well, I I um have kind of been taking an a la carte approach. I mm-hmm. didn't buy a pass or uh, get a press pass or anything like that. I've been like just kind of popping in on films that sounded interesting to me or seemed like big contenders at the festival, and just kind of I mean you know it is it is kind of a. Uh, like, I don't know, it's interesting because, like, on the one hand, it is kind of the dream, but on the other, it is still kind of like a slog. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, like, I'm 
you know, doing my normal AV club work and then trying to cram in three movies at night. And so, like, it is still yeah. a little bit intense, even going a la carte. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, a film festival is always going to be a lot, uh, I have I have yeah. found in my years, you know. Um, and mm. uh, it always sounds like we're bitching when we talk about that, to be honest. And maybe we are. <laughs> maybe, maybe we are. But, I mean, I don't know. Uh, it, it, it's... I've heard somebody once said, I'm paraphrasing somebody, I can't even remember who, but they said that one of the dirty secrets is that film festivals actually sometimes are not the best way to, to watch a movie, <laughs> you know, even though that's yeah. kind of all you're doing at them, you know? Well, we talk about festival brain all the time. You know, mm -hmm. what happens is you see a movie at a festival and then it comes out a year later and you end up watching it again a year later and go like either... Most of the time, I find I like it a little bit less <laughs> the uh, second time around. See, I go in the um, other direction I'm... usually. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. But that's a me okay. thing. I think I'm. I think I'm excessively cautious when it comes to my reactions to things. Sometimes. Um, yeah, maybe I get caught up in the whirl a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, but, but it's not like dramatic. I don't go from like an A to a C. Right, but, you right. You know, like I'll, I'll give something a B plus at a festival, and then it'll end up being a B or totally. a B. You'll turn into a C plus. Like you know, it's just a little bit of downgrade with the benefit of hindsight, I guess. Yeah, well, and the reality is that when you're watching that many movies in in that close a period of time, your critical faculties, I think, are a little, at least a little compromised. And I always tell people that you should take festival reactions in general with some kind of grain of salt because. Mm -hmm. uh, Everybody who's doing these, who's writing these, uh, they are they are generally watching several movies a day, and they are often racing out an opinion on the film too. I mean, general criticism uh, is often on a deadline, so we will sometimes see a movie and have until the next day to write about it. But usually, sure. there's a slightly larger window than that, which means that you can get a couple days sometimes several days to think about something before you're expressing your thoughts on it. Yeah, this is a little bit of a tangent, but my preference is to watch something, go to sleep, and then wake up and write the review in the morning. Like, I find if you go more than, like, a few days after watching something, then it's not quite as vivid in your mind. Well, especially but at a festival. I do, yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I do like to sleep on things. <laughs> oh, for sure, for sure. Um, and it's it's nice when you can do that, for sure. Um, I mean, oh, th it's the best. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this year has been, um, it's just, it's so interesting to do it virtually because in some respects, mm -hmm. you are a little bit more master of your own schedule. You're, you're less, um, you are less beholden to that particular, like, it, it's not a 9 a.m. screening. I mean, it does depend on your badge as well. I know some folks are basically like, your screening starts at 6 p.m. and you have a four-hour window in there to watch it. Uh, other mm -hmm. people have badges where you can just kind of watch things when you want to because they're available mm -hmm. virtually. Um, but mm -hmm. either either way, I think there is a degree of um, there is a degree of freedom, at least to decide when you watch something that you don't necessarily have. Uh, when you're on the ground, when it's just like there are these set times, you know. Do you think that that has changed the sort of like? Uh critical um bubble you know where like normally everyone would be walking out of a screening on their phone typing up their reaction but if people are staggering watching things and like you're not really getting the same kind of uh wave of all the reactions at once are you well the thing is that i think that a lot of people are aware that uh I think that a lot of people are timing the way that they're watching these things so that their uh -huh. first reaction happens pretty much at the exact stop of the exact moment where they can release a reaction, if you know what I mean. Okay. Like if if, yeah, if, sure. if something becomes available at 8 p.m., they basically are watching it at, directly at 8 p.m. so that they can be one of the first people having a reaction to it. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's the festival ecosystem. You know, you want to be first, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, I have not been first on a lot of things this year. Um, yeah, but you're really good at those uh, – putting out your tweets with your reactions to things yeah. like you're really good about that <laughs> which is uh you know uh, a little nerve-wracking in of itself and i think there's definitely there's there's a margin of error for doing that where you're just kind of trying to instantly i just try to tell people that like these are fundamentally first impressions you know yeah um and i think that's true of a tweet but it can it's also true of whatever we write from a festival because there's just you're yeah. seeing so much in such a short period of time and you're you don't have a lot of time to let it marinate i have to imagine mm -hmm. it, it actually is a little bit of a nightmare for the filmmakers sometimes because like they mm -hmm. worked for a year two years maybe longer on this film 
and suddenly it's being decided in the court of critical opinion in a matter of like a, a few tweets or a few seconds. Seconds. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Like I mean, literally seconds. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you'll see it and um, you'll see it at like a, a IRL festival where the minute that the lights go up, just everyone's screens turn on and people are sort of not like knocking out these these very yeah. th- these instant reactions all to the, the films. phones come out yeah yep. everybody pulls out their phone yep so i don't know i'm i i'm a part of that system but i sometimes um i sometimes question wh- whether it's the best way to do this well sure <laughs> you know? well I, sure I, <laughs> I mean you know like can't fight city hall i guess right yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know i i've talked to um i've talked to my predecessor in this job scott tobias the former uh film editor of the av club um many years ago at this point. Um, And he talks very wistfully about the days before, the days before the internet was sort of requiring, had created this expectation of daily coverage of a festival. And he was Mm -hmm. like, it was great. You would go to a festival for a week or two weeks you would watch all the movies. You would you would do no writing during the festival, and then at the end, you would write a rap piece, and that would be it. And it's just like, oh my god, I know. Wow, <laughs> that's like when you hear about people used to get paid a dollar a word, and you're like, oh my god, fuck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's wild, but you know, I mean. I don't know. There's some trade-offs, right? Like fewer people probably had access to Sundance back then, and oh, for sure. You know, if a ma- if a magazine was paying a dollar a word, then they were publishing fewer pieces. You know, there were just fewer opportunities. Uh, Very true. I, I actually ca- kind of can't imagine how some people even afforded to to do it back then, um, mm-hmm. given the cost of a festival. Because a normal festival, unlike a virtual one, is very pricey. I mean, you're getting you're you're not only you're not only paying for airfare, you're paying for lodging and whether Mm-hmm. If you're lucky, your outlet pays for it. If not, I know there are a lot of freelancers just pay for that out of pocket and hope that the assignments yeah. that they get cover the difference, you know? Oh, the housing is what will really get you. Oh, yeah. Honestly. For sure. <laughs> That's the most expensive part. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's get into the movies a little bit. Uh, I, I think we're, yeah. we're, we're not going to dwell too much on each of these. We're going to try to – I think uh, this is more a note for myself, I think, than than for the readers. But, uh, <laughs> or those, sorry, the listeners. But uh, I think we're just going to try to – we're going to try to move through these fairly quickly. But, w- you know, the mm-hmm. two of us have seen a few mo- – have both seen a few movies. Um, and yeah. uh, let's talk about some of those. Okay. So we already talked about Coda and the big sale that it had. What else – it was a big like marquee title from this year's Sundance. You think? I think the biggest title at this year's Sundance, the, the one that's sort of the, the the big blue chip movie that they got, uh, the one that I think that even in a in a quote unquote normal year that they would mm-hmm. be very very proud to be showing and w- would be sort of at the top of the list of people's interest is uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. Yeah, yeah, that one's been. I mean, I think that was one was originally supposed to come out last fall, but they ended up uh, uh, delaying it. Right. And and now it's uh, because of because of the pushed back Academy Awards calendar, because now um, Mm -hmm. in this strange pandemic year, the rules have been changed so that the for Oscar eligibility, you can now uh, your movie can premiere in some in some form before the end of February and you're still eligible for Oscars. I agree that this is a movie that I think would have come out in a normal year, would probably have come out in December it is now coming out in a couple weeks uh, to mm-hmm. uh, to select theaters and also to HBO Max. I think it yep. is it is being positioned as uh, as kind of in a potential Oscar contender. I think that's what they want for it, and uh, you can see why because I think this is I think you and I agree that this is a pretty strong film. Yeah, I think that um, the acting categories at the Oscars, I would hope to see a lot of names from this film in yep. those categories in particular. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so the film, which is directed by Shaka King, is uh, it's it is basically about the late 1960s and specifically about what was going on in the Black Panther Party, and even more specifically mm-hmm. about the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. Um, yes, Chicago, the West Side. That's right. Um, and uh, it focuses mainly on the uh, the chairman of the Illinois chapter, which is Fred. Uh, his name was Fred Hampton. Uh, he was murdered in. Um, in 1969, I believe, and yep. uh, mm-hmm. now it is it is sort of uh, generally accepted that that it was an assassination carried out by the FBI, um, mm-hmm. and and the movie sort of does take that as as a fact, and um, the the movie is about the the couple years leading up to that basically, and uh, I think this movie takes a really shrewd and uh, honestly kind of genius dramatic angle on that. Which is that mm-hmm. uh, it unfolds not just from the perspective of Hampton himself, and Hampton is played by Daniel Kaluuya, 
the uh, the 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 very good actor from Get Out and uh, also from Widows. Um, yeah, he was he was great in Widows, and I um, said in my review that I th- like he was really really intense in Widows, mm-hmm. and I saw little flashes of that here. Only instead of like villainous energy, it was uh, righteous anger. Totally, which I thought was pretty cool. Yep, I I, I mean I, I think his performance in Get Out is one of the better ones of the last decade. I think that's just a brilliant, totally. reactive performance. There's so much going on in every scene with him where he's like n- he's like negotiating how much he's willing to put up with in this situation, and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I think that's a great piece of acting in that. Uh, I think he's strong in this I, the accent's a little uh, I think the accent's a little dodgy um, it, mm. I mean, the, the movie ends with um, with footage of the real Hampton as as many biographical dramas do and uh, I think you can definitely hear the difference between how the real Hampton talked and, and how Kaluuya is, is talking in the film but on the other hand I also am of the opinion that um, that when you're playing a real person it does not need to be some sort of uh, some sort of eerie yeah no, I d- right. you're not you know? an impressionist, right? Exactly. You're <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, you're embodying this person. You're not. A, you're, you're not doing an impersonation. So. <laughs> well, speaking of embodying, I thought uh, Kuya did a great job with that. Like he, just his physical presence in the movie is very like kind of steadfast and strong. You get the impression that he's just a really solid person. For sure, and and I think he conveys the idea of somebody who knows that he sort of has to be on a lot of the time because mm-hmm. of his role in this party and mm-hmm. uh, because of his role in the movement, um, that he sort of always has to be projecting a certain side of himself. Right, and that's what makes the, like, uh, I, I think the emotional anchor in the story is the love story between uh, Fred Hampton and uh, Deborah Johnson. She later changed her name, but that was her name around this time. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's played by Dominique Fishback, and their romance, I think, is kind of the emotional anchor that kind of keeps the story from flying off into more thriller territory. Mm-hmm. Well, so it's interesting you say that, because I actually do think that the more interesting side of this film, and, and, and what I was saying before that I think is this, the kind of genius dramatic angle of this film, is that a lot of it actually unfolds from the perspective of of William O'Neill. And William O'Neill mm-hmm. was an FBI informant who essentially infiltrated the Black Panthers. And uh, yes. so he was feeding information to the FBI uh, in the guise of being a loyal member of the party. And uh, mm-hmm. he's played in the film by Lakeith Stanfield, who uh, folks who is also in Get Out, but who is uh, sort of has a prominent role in Atlanta and has been in probably every fifth movie you've seen over the last uh, five years or so, you know? And honestly, he improves every single one. Like I, He does. Honestly, I'm always I, happy to see him, <laughs> you know? Yes. No, he he, re- he brings something to every single film he's in. Like, I really admire him as an actor. I think he's really good. Totally. And I think he's I think he's terrific in this film. Um, and I think that uh, when I when I said that, I think that it's kind of a genius angle. I think that it's I think it's really smart of the movie to unfold partially from his perspective because Mm -hmm. it helps the movie steer away from the kind of the slightly more um, hagiographic direction that a lot of biodramas take. I mean, this movie is obviously very admiring of of Fred Mm -hmm. Hampton and of the Black Panthers and I think that there's a version of this movie that would be um, I guess you could say straightforward nobility from start to finish. You know, right, right, right. That would just be all about um, about Hampton and about his accomplishments. And I think that Stanfield's character adds an element of suspense. It adds an element of ambiguity. I think a lot of the film hangs on his shifting feelings or what might be his shifting feelings about this, about this operation that he's a part of. And yeah, um, he's a really evasive character. Yeah. And I think Stanfield's performance actually reflects that because it's, it's like on the one hand, uh, Bill O'Neill had to be a great liar, a one like a great liar, great actor, just to infiltrate and get as close to Fred Hampton as he did, right? Yes. But on the other hand, the way Stanfield plays the character, he's a he's a jumpy, nervous guy who, whenever he's under stress, he has a really hard time hiding his emotions. Totally. Like there's what there's one scene where he finds out that the Panthers had um you know tortured and killed a uh, a a rat, an informant, and he goes. And Stanfield, he starts going like, yeah, yeah, man, if I was there, I would have killed him too. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally, right. totally. He just has a hard time containing his nervousness there. And I found that that gave the character uh, like an ambiguity in the performance as well as in the script. Well, and I think it also gives us a, a kind of queasy form of identification with him because mm. I think the movie is kind of cer- – like, like he is – I mean, the movie makes no bones about the fact that this guy is, um, I mean, for lack of a better word, a rat. You know, I mean, he's somebody yeah. who who 
who got coerced into into basically selling out the Black Panthers to the FBI. Mm -hmm. So the movie, it does not sentimentalize him. But I think at the same time, it does provoke empathy for him in the sense that he is somebody who is who is trapped in this system the way that so many others are. Um, yeah. And beyond that, there is a general, I, I think there there is something immediately sympathetic about watching somebody uh, maybe somebody in, in undercover work, especially, or at, at least in, in the in the form of a movie, somebody who is constantly in danger of being uncovered and who is always mm-hmm. trying to uh, to avoid that fate. Yeah, and there's um, uh, even a dream sequence in the movie where we really get the impression of how of the like the inner panic that's inside of O'Neill all the time. For sure. So I, I know I, I thought this was is a pretty propulsive piece of filmmaking. I think that it covers. Mm-hmm. Um, it covers a lot of uh, a lot a lot of historical events in a really in a really stylish and but also really straightforward way. Um, I admired that uh, as a point of comparison. I admired that it doesn't play a fraction of the bullshit games with um, cliche and with embellishing things that something like the Trial of Chicago Seven does. Which um, yeah, it truly does doesn't do any of that. Yeah, no, uh, it, but I would say almost almost to a fault to a little bit because there is a small mm. part of me watching this film, and I think this is quite a good film. As I said, I will ha- I'll, I'll be happy to see a lot of people involved in it get uh, a lot of attention in in the coming days. In coming weeks, um, there is a small part of me that wishes that it took a little bit more dramatic liberty because I do think the heart of this film could be the relationship between these two men, and and the film does not try to engineer that in any way, possibly because they did not have a close relationship. No. You know, um, yeah, and right uh, because that's part of what you might expect in this film, right? You're like, oh, Daniel Kaluuya and Lakeith Stanfield, ooh, they're gonna have a scene where they like face off. It's gonna be really exciting. And the movie doesn't give you that because, yeah, that's not what happened. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, but there's a part of me that that um, believes that there are times when it's okay to take some dramatic liberties, and there, there's a part of me that that uh, felt a desire to see these two um, to, to at least understand, for example, O'Neill's own perspective on Hampton a little bit better because the movie doesn't. Mm. It, it, you're right that it's such an evasive performance, and it's not like he's ever really. There's no scene where O'Neill suddenly like breaks down and says everything he's feeling. Um, he remains a bit of an enigma throughout, and uh, yeah. there's at least a small part of me that that wanted to that wanted to know his perspective on Hampton a little bit more. Yeah, um, I I think the closest you get to that is there's a shot where um, uh, you see Stanfield and tears are welling up in his eyes, and again he's having a hard time containing his emotions. And uh, uh, Kaluuya says to him, "Is it, w- what's wrong? You know, what's going on?" And he goes, uh, "Do you want another drink?" You know, he—that's yeah. uh, th- the closest we really come to seeing how he really feels is the fact that he's overwhelmed with emotion, thinking about what he's what he's doing and what he's about to do. Totally, and I think that um, Stanfield makes that uh, makes makes his um, his refusal to be forthcoming about anything really. It, he makes that compelling. I think on a scene by scene level. Yeah, totally. And um, I agree with you with uh, telling it partially from his perspective. Like some critics, uh, including Robert Daniels, who was a guest on our show last summer, have said that, you know, just the fact that, you know, there's a getting a Fred Hampton biopic is something uh, kind of unprecedented. And it's a little disappointing that it wasn't really a Fred Hampton biopic. And I understand that. But I also kind of felt like the way the movie shifts in the second half to where Um, you know, all this evasiveness and uh, sort of confusion, it really kind of plays that up by withholding pieces of information from the audience and doling out information in these sort of like sneaky sleight of hand ways. And I really admired that as a storytelling technique. Totally. So another, another movie that I watched on your recommendation where I feel like there was a lot that was kind of being unsaid and a lot of kind of subtext in the movie. And that was uh, John in the Hole. Which is a very straightforward story, but thematically it had a lot going on. Yeah, I, I agree. I actually think that this thing's strength is largely thematic in, in a lot of ways. I think it was yes, just saying some I, kind of strong things. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was really, I thought it was really frustrating as a story, but really fascinating as, uh, I guess, as a thematic statement. <laughs> yeah, totally. Although I will say that I am somebody who, um, 
I don't know if I'm just a glutton for punishment, but I sort of, I sometimes sort of love stories that are deliberately evasive and do not deliver in a way that you think they're going to, you know? <laughs> so I appreciated well, this sure. on that level. <laughs> um, I think that's a critic thing because you is. see so many movies and when one subverts your expectations, you're like, oh, wow. <laughs> I know. Well, uh, our former colleague, uh, uh, Caitlin Penzimug, um, who uh, formerly of, uh, she was a book editor for a little while. She was also a, a copy editor uh, and um, was eventually... Uh, uh, an assistant editor at, at the mm-hmm. publication. Um, Katie once said to me that she felt like that Ignati and I, she was talking about Ignati and I, and she was like, I feel like the two of you watch so many movies that you just will praise anything that's different. You're like anything yeah. that plays differently. And, I and think I, that's I, true. I, yeah. I mean, it, when you watch as much as we watch, movies get predictable. And when something yeah, scrambles I don't think it's that, a bad thing. I yeah. truly don't think it's a bad thing. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, in, in any case, so... But yeah, this one has a weird, straightforward, but very weird premise, right? Yeah, <laughs> I almost want to tiptoe around it, even though the, mm. even though the, Sundance, um, the Sundance catalog um, just outright states what it is. And if you go to IMDb, <laughs> if you want to know what this movie is about, re- what it's really about, you can go to IMDb and it'll say it right there. I am going to give... I will provide the uh, a vaguer version of it because I actually okay. do think this is a film that benefits from going in cold. It is about a 13-year-old boy who is living in uh, a sort of nondescript sort of rural town with his with with, with his folks and yeah. uh they live on the outskirts of the woods and uh he's kind of he's slightly un- I would say he's sort of unknowable in the way that maybe a lot of kids his age are unknowable. He just sort of mm, interesting. You know, he seems he, he seems a little blank and uh something mm-hmm. happens early into the film where this kid, uh, I guess the way I described it in my review was um, the kid finds a way to engineer some some alone time and some distance between himself and his family, played by Michael C. Hall, right. uh, Jennifer Ale, and Tessa Formiga. Um, yep. They play his mother, his mother, father, and sister. And he finds a way to um, to basically engineer a Home Alone scenario, which I realize everyone is just <laughs> comparing it to Home Alone, but it's impossible not to. So a lot of the movie is this kid alone in his house, and it becomes this kind of mystery of motivation about what's going on in this kid's head, why he's doing yeah. what he's doing. Uh, what did you think of it? That's exactly what uh, that's what I found frustrating and interesting about it Mm -hmm. was that like, you know, when you want to talk about storytelling and character, having a character like this kid who does just seem to be a total blank Mm -hmm. is really frustrating. But thematically, I felt like that was really interesting because I, I, I it's kind of hard to articulate. This, I felt like this movie was getting at, but it was something about like adulthood and childhood and of forging your own identity and the sort of like there is kind of an emptiness to that age where you don't, you know, you're not, you're not a child and you're not an adult and like you're not really anything and the kind of like confusion and all these things that can come in to fill the vacuum during that time of your life. Totally. Uh, yeah, I think it's very much about that indeterminate line between childhood and adulthood and there is a scene mm-hmm, where mm-hmm. where Jennifer Ailes character raises that that question and about when do you stop feeling like a child and when do you start feeling like an adult and yes. um i think that this movie finds an outlandish way to talk about the fact that in a lot of modern culture uh in, including in america we sort of have for a lot of people there's this kind of nebulous zone that exists between childhood and adulthood and um i mean it, college for one is one great example of it where you have all of sure. the you have a lot of the freedoms of being an adult but very few of the responsibilities um, yeah we kind of hold people's hand into adulthood and which is why i think it kind of for a lot of people it extends if not indefinitely, but for a very long time. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about you. I mean, I, I have moments in my life where I feel like I could pinpoint as being like, I think that might be the moment where I was starting to become an adult for real. Yeah, I feel, well, I mean, you mentioned that scene with Jennifer Ale. What she says, I don't think this is giving too much away. Kind of what she says, I think is kind of the thesis statement of the movie is mm-hmm. you never stop being a kid. You just get more obligations. Yeah. And I don't think there was a certain moment in my life where I was like, okay, I'm an adult now. But like, there are moments where I sit and go like, when the hell did I get all these problems? <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think that like the 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 fear and dread of that kind of is what this movie is about. I think so. I think so. Um, there's also there's a metatextual element that I won't get into too much, but um, very sparsely de- uh, deployed in the film that I think is entirely there for contrast 
to talk about the difference between somebody being um, sort of gently led into adulthood and somebody being pushed Mm -hmm. into adulthood and what that looks Mm. like. I don't know. I found this thing fascinating. And I think it's super interesting that the movie is, in some respects, a psychological enigma. But I think thematically, in terms of what it's about, I think it's actually kind of clear. And and that tension to me is really interesting. And um, I don't know. I found it funny and suspenseful, too, in its its very – detached way because this is this is very much people have compared it to michael haneke it's very Mm. much a film that takes a um a kind of chill sort of puts a chilly distance between itself and the characters but i thought it worked in this case yeah i i like i said um i i felt it it, i thought about it a lot i found it very thought-provoking but yeah as a as a film it was kind of frustrating just because you know you're kind of like is this a portrait of a baby sociopath but it's not quite that you know what i mean it's not quite yeah. it's not that easy to put into a box well the film does not have those kind does not have the kind of um how do i put this uh, there's a certain kind of film that that presents a character who is um who might not be quite right and you kind mm-hmm. of wait on bated breath for for something uh, truly awful to happen and this film is not structured in that way necessarily no not at all but um moving on to another title a film that does take that turn and i thought in a kind of like exploitative way was a glitch in the matrix which speaking of people like not growing up and becoming detached from reality <laughs> um this film is about the whole idea of simulation theory the idea that we're living in the matrix And uh, this film opened with a really interesting concept and quote that I thought was really cool, which was that uh, people's under human beings understanding of consciousness is tied to whatever the most advanced technology at that Mm -hmm. time is. I love that. I thought that was super interesting how it went from us thinking about, um, you know, I'm not going to try to quote it. I remember the, the, the person who talks about it presents a, a series of technologies that help that, it, that seem to inform the way that people thought about the way that our, our bodies and our brains work. Mm-hmm. And um, now people tend to think of the, our brains like computers because that is what, that is the level of technology we've gotten to, you know? Right. And when, and when uh, electricity and telegraphs were the uh, most advanced form of technology, people thought a lot about like neurons and, you know, electrical current running through your brain. Totally. Yep. Well, that's an example I was searching for. So thank you. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I will say that it started off promisingly, but by the end of this movie, I honestly hated it. I really didn't <laughs> like this movie at all. Um, I felt, I know that Asher's whole thing is just presenting ideas and not really, you know, uh, validating them one way or the other but however just the <sighs> to me I found all the subjects in this film really frustrating because it there were just so many things I felt like they were really clinging to the simulation theory idea as a way to kind of sidestep or avoid like things about their life that maybe they don't really want to accept talking about life being like a video game and all these synchronicities and the world just opening up for you. I was like, yeah, man, you're a middle-class white guy. (laughs) Yeah, man. Of course the road just keeps opening up in front of you. And, and I found that really frustrating. Also, there's a lot of Elon Musk worship in this (laughs) that I thought was really annoying. (laughs) Well, I would say number one that I, I I'm not sure he's worshiping Eli, but I think this, some of the subjects are certainly. Well, no, he's not, but the subjects are for yeah. sure. The other thing is that I think that uh, the movie in in its most interesting moments actually allows. It, it sort of reminds me of the Errol Morris uh, effect, where people talk about Errol Morris when he interviews somebody who's um, somebody like Steve Bannon or like Robert McNamara. He sort of gives them the rope to hang themselves, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Although I don't think that's always successful in his films, honestly. And this, yeah, I don't think this one succeeded there. I think there are tons of little moments in this where without where Asher doesn't feel the need necessarily to um to uh, to underscore them. He just lets these people talk and reveal there's this very revealing moment for example where one of them talks about how well it makes total sense that um that we're living in a simulation because I have so much time so so much of a hard time connecting to people, you know? And that to me mm-hmm. is like one of those moments in the film that that unlocked it for me that um Asher that Asher is as with all of his films, I mean, he, uh, he's the documentarian who made Room 237 about uh, sort of shining obsessives who have their sort of wild interpretive beliefs of what the film's about. Also, uh, he made The Nightmare, which is about sleep paralysis and people sort of caught in mm-hmm. the grips of their own 
of their own minds. Um, I think that he is intensely interested in people who uh, have gone down the rabbit hole of their own uh, of their own obsessions and, and and their own sort of wild hypothesizing. And in this one, I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that these are that exactly what you're talking about that these are people who. Uh, who are using simulation theory as a way to account for things in their life that don't that don't add up or don't make sense or things in their life that that, that... they don't want to think too deeply about. Well, of course, honestly, of course, yeah. I mean, I mean, there's a moment too where one of the subjects talks about disassociating. Like he has a moment yeah. of disassociation. He's in church and he suddenly felt outside of his body. Now, I mean, a lot of people. This is an experience that some people have in life, where you have a moment where you step outside. Often, it, I think uh, drugs are involved when you when you feel this way, um, uh -huh. but it's not solely inspired by that. I think that he had that moment, and then for him, that was a scary moment of uh, sort of broadening awareness that he explained away with this theory. And um, I think there's a lot of that happening in this film. A lot of the interview subjects are using simulation theory as a way to deal with how scary the world is and how much they don't understand their own lives. Yeah, I mean, I guess, but I felt like in the second half is what really like kind of uh, angered me about mm -hmm. this movie because I felt like, okay, so to give a lot away, uh, they bring in this, this, uh, talk, this disembodied voice halfway through the film and, um, you know, he's really, you know, you he says some ridiculous things. Like, he's all like, oh, there's one part where he says, so I went to this store called Hot Topic. I don't know if you've heard of it. And it's just <laughs> kind of like risable, you know, the just embarrassing dorky shit this guy is saying. <laughs> and, but then it takes a turn to where he's describing how he's listening to lyrics of a drowning pool song. And he's reciting the lyrics to the drowning pool song before he starts talking about how he killed his parents. Yeah. And I... And I felt like introducing that element into a movie that is, you know, just not making any kind of judgments about whether we live in a simulation was kind of letting that guy off the hook for the fact that he really did in real life, which does exist, killed his own parents. And I found that really, I, I really didn't like that. Uh, I agree that it's in debatable taste. Um, although I don't know if I don't know if I entirely agree with its function. I, I don't think it's mm. necessarily meant to serve as just another voice airing uh, legitimate ideas about about this theory. I think it's actually meant to function as a bit of a, of a cautionary tale within this film to be like, this is where this line of thinking can lead you, honestly. Um, yeah, but if he never makes any sort of effort to refute or even provide a counter argument, then how are like how are you supposed to extrapolate that? You have to do that on your own. Yeah, I mean, I, which I don't think is impossible, but I, I get we're start, I guess we're starting to get into the question of um, to what extent to, to what extent does a filmmaker have responsibility if they're going to present people's ideas to refute them. Um, I think that uh, watching this film, I I mean, you and I both watched this film and probably and probably thought the same thing in the sense that like. I don't believe in simulation theory and uh, <laughs> like I think it's I think it's a little silly that it's gained as much popularity as it as it has and yeah. you you and I can watch this and we we can look at uh we can look at these talking heads talking about this and not necessarily be instantly persuaded simply because they're passionate and they're citing things. Mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean at what point do do we give the do we give the audience the same that same benefit of a doubt? Does he has does does there have to be a moment in the film where he says these people are crackpots for the audience to figure that out on their own? Yeah, I mean, sure, that's always true about about films, but I just felt that the way that that was shoehorned in there was just really distasteful and kind of exploit. This movie went from embarrassing to exploitative for me, and I just really didn't like it. <laughs> I agree with you that it's a distasteful <laughs> moment. I certainly do agree with you there. Uh, yeah. I, I, I question its 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 place in the film. Um, for me, uh, ultimately, I, I my issue with this film is mostly that I just think that um, too much of it is summary. Honestly, I think his last two films yeah. were very much about getting into the heads of of super interesting people, and in this case, um, I think that what you have is uh, a group of people discussing what I would probably call a mass delusion and um there are tons and tons of there's tons of reading you can do on this topic mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, I don't know how much this film actually adds to the conversation in so much i mean it, just google simulation theory and you will find a lot of articles right, that cover, exactly. cover the same terrain you know right exactly i felt like the 15 minutes i spent looking up simulation theory after watching this movie 
told me more about simulation theory than the actual movie. Yeah. <laughs> Which, was, yeah, you know, uh, this one, like, I really, I liked Asher's other work, but this one just really wasn't for me. Um, but one that I know we both liked that also kind of deals with dissociation mm-hmm. and online communities and uh, what I would call parasocial relationships is uh, one that was in the next section called We're All Going to the World's Fair. Now, I felt this one captured a lot of the stuff that they talked about in A Glitch in the Matrix. It conveyed it in a much more artistic in a way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the film isn't a documentary. Um, it uh, it takes a narrative yes. approach, although it takes a... Um a very uh, oblique one in some in some respects. Um, mm-hmm. We sort of, uh, for a while, I would say it's actually unclear exactly what kind of movie we're necessarily watching. Totally. Um, the film opens with this extended shot of this teenage girl, and she is setting up a webcam, and uh, we sort of see her whole process of recording a message, recording a video to, to her followers. And we sort of, it's, at one point, we see her abort the message, get up and walk around the room, turn, like turn off lights and walk back. And um, she's sort of been playing this online role-playing horror game called We're All Going to the, uh, Sorry, called The World's Fair Challenge. And mm-hmm. uh, the film is sort of just this portrait of her life. And it's a very, it is a, a, a very narrow one in the sense that we do not give, we do not get any sense of what her life is like beyond, beyond her relationship to the internet right. and this game, which I think, I think is largely the point. I mean, this is somebody who is, it, it becomes very clear is kind of isolated. Mm-hmm. I think the only the only sign we get that, that her parents are there is we get a off screen voice at one point in the movie, uh, sort of yelling for her to be quiet, and that is the yeah, only telling sign. her to stop making so much noise. Yeah, exactly, and that is the only that's all we get of her parents. We don't get any sense of a social life. We don't get any sense of her life outside of outside of this this horror game that she's playing online and. And her sort of daily, um, one would say, sort of uh, web surfing habits. Yeah, like the the only the fact that we we, sh- we don't see her at school, nothing like that. No real interactions with other people outside of online. Um, and I felt like so the base it's it's a creepy pasta riff, right? And mm-hmm. so the idea of the world's fair game is you watch this video and then things start to change for you. And so. Uh, it starts off, um, it kind of starts off as what, one of those screen life thrillers where it all mm-hmm. takes place online. Um, but it's it, uh, one thing I liked about this film is that it wasn't um, married, it wasn't orthodox about mm-hmm. <laughs> sticking to that screen life format. And, you know, you have the format where w- what you see on the screen is the character screen. But then you also have scenes that are, you know, just establishing shots of the extremely uh, generic neighborhood where she lives it's nothing but like auto zones and you know gas stations and walmarts Mm -hmm. it's really it's 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 not quite a liminal space but it's so normal that it's kind of not really there and um i like that it wasn't married to that format at all but it used the format through i I liked how it it was uh, almost multimedia in a sense so the way it pulled in all these different things and anyway, so one of the things that happens when you do this World's Fair challenge is people will say like, oh, I can't feel my body or I'm turning to plastic. And uh, so it's dissociation that they're talking about. And dissociation mm-hmm. is uh, a fairly common experience that people have in you know the internet age. Mm-hmm. Um, particularly, you know, in the past year, there's been a lot of writing about people dissociating to try to deal with you know the news that the only way they can deal with it is to just kind of uh, un- untether their mind from their body. And um, one thing that's interesting about this film is the director, uh, they said that, uh, so the character is not uh, transgender explicitly or um, non-binary explicitly, but the director uh, is. And they said that uh, it was kind of body dysmorphia was the, f- it's, it's another dissociative feeling uh, a very unpleasant one that uh, they were kind of trying to harness uh, in this film. Interesting. Yeah, I can definitely mm-hmm. see that. I mean, uh, what I found so fascinating about this film is that um, I think it's 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 totally about, you know, we talked about John in the Hole as this kind of mystery of motivation. And in mm-hmm. some respects, I think this film is a little bit, it sort of uh, is that too, to some extent as well. Um, because I think... Uh, 
we start we share this character's perspective. We're locked into this character's perspective, and we understand that she is, in some respects, role playing because she's playing this game online. Mm-hmm. At a certain point, though, the lines between is her distress real and and I'm playing a game begin to blur in a way, in a way that I think speaks very much to uh, that in a, the, our inability to to tell that all the time in all digital communication, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Like some of the things that she ends up saying and thinking and doing are very disturbing, but it is unclear whether she's playing the game or she's saying that the game did this to her. And it's like, does she really believe that? Or is she still playing the game? That's very unclear. Exactly. And the film actually comes to hinge on her relationship with somebody else uh, who she meets through this game. And I, I, I don't, again, I don't want to say too much about that. It, this is especially for a film that most people will not be able to see for quite some time um probably you know whenever it whenever it goes into commercial release but um mm-hmm. i think the relationship between these characters and the unknowability between them and, and the lines between how much of this is we're playing a game and we're performing and how much of this is we're trying to make general like genuine in routes to connection um i found really fascinating and i think says a lot about about the way that we communicate in the current era you know it's remarkable yeah, exactly. that how much the internet has reshaped life in general and the way that we we communicate mm-hmm. with each other and how few movies really get into that and really get into it in a thoughtful sensitive way yeah and in this film like the content and the theme and the tone it all tied in really well together because it all ties into what you're talking about the way that the internet uh shapes uh, our lives and our and what and how we think about ourselves and who we are. It's also just such an eerie, unsettling film in a lot of ways. It really uh, is. It's, yeah, I yeah, think yeah, I think yeah. because it's trying to capture um, not just this creepy pasta world and and uh, but also the mindset of somebody who is immersing themselves in that uh, rather obsessively. I mean, this is somebody who is d- absolutely at least from what we see has has dove into this world like like headfirst. You know, uh, yeah. Um, one thing that I would I would love to hear a teenager's perspective yes. on this movie. Yeah. Um, that was one thing that Tasha Robinson, who uh, uh, used to work for AV Club, now she's at The Verge. She she said that she would really like to to hear you know people of different ages thoughts on this mm-hmm. film because when I was watching it, I just wanted to take the main character and hug her and like tell her like it's <laughs> yeah. okay, it's not real, <laughs> you know. But yeah. I would be very curious what a teenager who someone who has lived their entire life in this digital realm, who's never known life before the internet, what they would think about something like this. I totally agree. I, I, I would love to know that as well. Yeah. Um, there is another film at the festival that both of us saw that is partially about, um, at least superficially, about uh, the dangers of media and maybe about horror and especially, uh, especially mm-hmm. and about how um, the question of whether or not something uh, violent media can take a hold of you. And uh, that is one of the mid- this year's Midnight Selections called Censor. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting the way that the, I, and kind of provocative the way that this film like kind of entertained the idea of violent media inspiring violence, considering that it's a horror film. And that particular opinion was very unpopular among people that like horror films because it's basically implying like, oh, you're going to murder somebody because you like horror movies. And right. No one wants to hear that. Not to mention statistically, it's just not true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it becomes about something um, something more. Actually, I, I in the same sense that you were talking about John and the Hole being a film that you found um interesting on a thematic level, maybe more than a storytelling level. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that this lands in a place that I found uh, super interesting. This has a great last scene, um, Mm -hmm. which counts for a lot. I found a lot of it, though, to be a little one note, I'll be honest with you. Yeah, I agree that this is stronger uh, thematically. And I thought the direction, uh, as a first-time feature director, I thought the direction was pretty strong, very thoughtful, a lot of thoughtful details in it. But as a story, yeah, I I didn't. I I thought that was the weakest part of it. Yeah. Well, the film. So the film follows uh, Enid, who is a uh, she's a film censor. So uh, it is her job to say if something is fit for release. Um, and uh, she is working in the UK in the 1980s, the early 1980s, during what's uh, often known as the video nasty era. Um, yeah, infamous video nasties. Yeah. Yep. Th- this era when there were um, some pretty hardcore horror movies coming out, and but there was also this huge crackdown by the British government. On yes. these films to say these films yeah, are dangerous. Yeah, this is a British phenomenon. Yeah. Very much so. And uh, these films are dangerous to society, so we need to um, we need to be protecting people from them. And Enid mm-hmm. is sort of a 
she's sort of a, a a soldier on the front lines of this war. You could say it's her job to uh, to 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 say what is uh, acceptable to release and what needs what we need to all be protected from. And um, and the character does seem to believe that that she, she is protecting society by banning violent movies. She does really seem to think that she's like a true believer, indeed. Yeah. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And the film sort of is about her unraveling. I, I've seen people compare it to uh, Peter Strickland's film, Barbarian Sound Studio, which... Uh, that, yeah, like the setting. Yeah, for was. sure. I mean, sort of dealing with somebody in this particular period of time, sort of uh, immersing themselves in the uh, in in some sort of exploitation film. I mean, in that film, you're dealing with somebody who is a Foley artist and is doing Foley work for this mm-hmm. uh, this kind of crass italian horror movie um (laughs) you know uh i wish that this film got into a little bit more of the nitty-gritty of being a censor because i think that's a super Mm. fascinating job and would love Mm -hmm. to know more about it you know i mean you have this Mm -hmm. this sort of amazing milieu and i wanted to learn a little bit more about it it it, it sort of turns instead into this it's kind of this mystery about uh the characters the the character has this trauma from her past and some of the film starts to uh she watches a film that starts to uh kind of evoke some of that and it becomes this mystery about what happened in her past it's it seems to have been made as a message directly for her at least that's how she interprets it right and i have to confess i found a lot of that less compelling than i did just kind of the general the general capturing of this particular time and place and um right yeah 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 i agree with that 100 percent. like i i thought the setting was compelling and they did a good job with the period and, and the concept is great but there were certain elements of this story like you know not to break it down too much certain elements where i kind of went like what you know yeah. like when you were reading the screenplay i i just mm, pro- when films have problems and like major like uh, flaws of logic on a screenplay level I'm always kind of like guys it's free to fix that <laughs> <laughs> so it's always something that I tend to be critical of because it's like y- you gotta get the script right before you shoot the movie I think totally um, I do think it ends on a great note I'll say that and uh, mm-hmm. I think as a it whole... had a lot going for it yeah. like some of the some of the, there's a lot of dream sequences in this film and some of them were su- were really creepy it just kind of hits the same note though over and over again in, mm-hmm, in, in, in mm-hmm. my in, in in my opinion I don't know it just sort of um it, it establishes this this co- sort of unnerving tone and then doesn't waver much from it over the course of its yeah. 80 85 minutes or whatever <laughs> but uh well that one was consistent but a movie that was all over the damn place <laughs> <laughs> it's prisoners of the ghost land which is uh director uh Sion Sono he's famous pr- relatively famous sort of a cult favorite Japanese director mm-hmm. he did suicide club he did love exposure uh, those are kind of his two big cornerstones in the West. And this is his first English language film, which he made uh, with Nicolas Cage in the starring role. And I thought it was interesting. Um, this sort of cross, it, it's this cross cultural mashup of Japanese and American uh, sort of genre movie tropes kind of mm-hmm. smushed together. And uh, there's been so much back and forth between America and Japan where at certain points it's like, the origins are just so blurred you know at this point totally yeah i mean i think about like um like the relationship like, between like um like man- lucas and kurosawa right yeah, totally or or, or that or, was 40 years ago yep or something like a fistful of dollars versus your mm-hmm. you know basically yes, telling exactly. the same story but one of them is set in uh, feudal Japan, and it is about samurais, and the other one is set in the Old West. Uh, these two, these kind of two central mythologies uh, of of uh, sort of legendary periods of of national identity, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, this film mashes them together. It's hardly the first film to do that, obviously. Um, right. Takashi Miike this- made his own addition to this particular subgenre one would say a few years ago actually at this point yeah uh about few, 15 years ago it was really trendy to do these uh japanese american cross-cultural uh mashups so what did you think of the film um i <laughs> i thought that it what tickled me about this film was that there are lots of elements of famous american sort of cult films in this you know, like uh, the the there's a core plot element where Nicolas Cage has a um, a collar around his neck, and if he doesn't complete his mission in time, it'll blow up. 
you know, Escape from New York mm-hmm. and um, the, some of the costumes in it and some of the um, uh, sets kind of reminded me of Time Bandits, the Terry Gilliam movie. Yeah. And what tickled me about it is I could see this director watching a bunch of American kind of cult classic movies and going, oh, shit, I could do that. <laughs> and that's what tickled me about it. Um, like as a story, it was just all over the place. And um you know, a lot of the the selling point of it is Nicolas Cage being Nicolas Cage, but uh, I think he was uh, he was a lot better in Color Out of Space. I thought. Yeah, I think he phones this one in to be honest, and mm-hmm. um, I think that Cage has found this kind of side hustle making weird, crazy quilt genre movies. I, I think another, mm-hmm. another film this does not stylistically resemble at all, but at least at least in its sort of um, we're going to throw a bunch of things together construction it, it might resemble is is Mandy, which he made a couple years yeah. ago. And I think that Cage was throwing a lot more of himself into that film as well. Um, mm-hmm. In this one, I think Cage seems self-aware that he doesn't have to do a lot in this role, that him just mm. being there, that that we're seeing Nicolas Cage with, um, with a collar on his neck and bombs on his back on his balls I yes think. the other bombs are on his balls yes because <laughs> yeah. the 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 young woman he's rescuing he uh you know he's not supposed to do anything untoward <laughs> exactly so i mean cage has a moment in the movie where he gets to yell testicles and you know i mean there's a mm. moment where he has a, a samurai sword but the movie to me it felt a little bit with cage's performance in this film it felt a little bit like the movie just sort of presents him and says have fun and that Cage yeah. himself could it could almost be a digital avatar of Cage for the <laughs> for the degree to which he is invested in this part. And uh-huh. I do think that's partially the material too. I don't think that there's room for much nuance in this film. I think this is Yeah, like, no. This is definitely just to like throw a bunch of stuff into a bag and shake it up and then dump it back out kind of kind of movie. It felt honestly it felt a little bit to me like B movie porn, and I don't mean that it's particularly pornographic. I just mean that this movie exists, I think to satisfy a particular audience and uh you know people often talk about quentin tarantino as somebody who if you were if you were like confronted by tarantino at a party he would probably just corner you and tell you all about his obsessions (laughs) which is what his movies are kind of like sometimes but the thing is that tarantino subverts that sometimes and tarantino makes movies that have their own their, their own flavor and their own rhythm and that uh that often don't play the way that they're that whatever he's influencing, at least his later films, I think his later films are their own thing, even though they might. Yeah, be I think he puts things. more more of himself into his more recent work. And it's funny you bring up Tarantino because he was in Sukiyaki Western Django, yes. Takashi Miike's Western. <laughs> yep, yep. Which I think <laughs> is a better version movie. of this, to be honest. And I, yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. part because I think that that movie is doing more than just presenting these things. That's what I ultimately felt about Prisoners of the Ghost Land. I, I felt very alienated. Um, about my reaction to it because there were so many people I saw so many people online who just had a blast with this and I kept feeling like I was getting I was getting sold the plastic imitation of a blast I was like oh well this thing has all these elements that are that are supposedly fun but it hasn't necessarily strung them together in a way that's interesting or unique or even all that entertaining it's just like look here's Bill Mosley he's in those Rob Zombie movies y'all like right here's Nick Cage totally. with bombs on his balls you know and, and, and just leaves it at that Totally. Yeah. And I think there really, truly is an audience uh, that films like this are kind of made for and Mm -hmm. they do really eat them up. And you know what? God bless them. Like, (laughs) I don't know. I thought this movie was kind of a lark. Um, I I, I don't think that it's, you know, going to be a cornerstone of cinema at any point. But if you like just crazy shit for the sake of crazy shit, why not? Yeah. So, yeah, that's all the movies that we collectively saw. But, I mean, you've been uh, watching quite a – I think you're watching quite a few more than I have. So what are some movies that I didn't get a chance to see that you really liked at Sundance? Okay. Um, well, so this wasn't this, – this isn't like – I don't think anybody's going to look back on this and think this was one of the great Sundances for a lot mm-hmm. of reasons. Um, I think that the, that the selections were limited by a number of factors, one of them being that some filmmakers just don't want to premiere their movie in a digital – on a, on a digital platform and this is fundamentally yeah, and that's fine. right and this is fundamentally a less glamorous event than past sundances but there have been some good films uh, some of which we've talked about already and uh just to point people in the direction of a couple other ones um i quite enjoyed uh jared carmichael's um directorial debut he's obviously the the uh former 
the former star of the Carmichael Show. He's a former sitcom star and stand-up comedian. Uh, he's made his directorial debut, and uh, with a kind of kind of a risky premise, he plays a man who has decided that he wants to. Uh, he's decided he's going to commit suicide, and in order to do that, he sort of enlists the help of a of a friend who has recently attempted suicide and failed. He breaks him out of his mm-hmm. institution. They've been they've been friends since childhood. His friend, played by Christopher Abbott, um, has been sort of grappling with with suicidal ideation and depression. That's for, a real rising star, Christopher Abbott. He's been in a lot of stuff these past couple He years. has, and he's so terrific, and he's so funny in this. Um, yes, this is a comedy. Um, IMDb says it's a drama, but uh, I, I don't think it's a drama. It's definitely a comedy. It's about um, the two of them basically make the decision that they're going to kill each other, that they're, they're going to – it's a suicide pact, essentially. <laughs> but then they decide um, – I don't know why I laughed at that. <laughs> well, I mean – the movie, <laughs> pres- uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a dark premise, but I think the movie toes a really, a really tricky line, which is that it is neither it's neither glib about this decision that they make. The movie takes mm-hmm. their depression and their desire, their desire to die very seriously, but at the same time, it's not maudlin about it either. This is not a movie about like characters talking about learning to to to, to uh, appreciate the value of life. Or having bi- having big long conversations about where their life went wrong. It's a really it's kind of a fast paced fuck around buddy comedy that ha- mm. that happens to be building potentially to the two of them uh, killing themselves or or each other. Anyway. Wow. Yeah, and I, I think it threads that needle pretty well. I don't think it's a perfect film. I think it actually could have could have stood to be a little bit longer. It's uh, like Censor, I believe it's eighty it's eighty four minutes, and I think it. A, a solid 15 or 20 could have been tacked on that would have maybe gotten maybe helped us get to know these characters a little bit better um but it is uh i'm impressed but that it exists one might say and that it manages to score so many laughs without feeling disrespectful about this topic yeah that's a fine line for sure it really is um so the other film that i saw at the festival that, that i was really kind of taken with is uh it's this documentary called flea and uh, it is about a, a young man from Afghanistan and his whole refugee experience getting to the United States. And, uh, you know, we've obviously I think we've seen films about th- this subject matter before. This film takes uh, a, a somewhat um, a somewhat unique tack on that uh, in that almost the entire film is animated. Now, that that was a choice mm-hmm. made partially um, to assure the involvement of of the film's um the film's whole subject and talking head uh, because because he because he feels that it's important to um, to maintain anonymity and uh, to hide his identity so a lot so instead of seeing his face we're seeing an animated version but at a certain point you realize that the animation style is also becomes this really vivid way to to bring his memories to life because the film is mostly him talking about his experience um, in, a, in Afghanistan in the late 80s and also him um and him leaving the country and the sort of harrowing events that went on in his life. And at the start of the film, I, I sort of felt this, um, I was like, I don't, I felt distracted a little bit by his voiceover competing with the animation, which is often very striking. Um, okay. During more, tra- during the sort of more traumatic memories he's talking about, it's mm. this really harsh charcoal or charcoal animation style. So, mm-hmm. At first, I was sort of like, am I going to be able to adjust to this? Because I feel like I'm constantly just watching the animation and being distracted from what he's saying. Um, okay. But I got into the rhythm of the film, and by the end of it, I felt so so invested in this person's journey and this person's happiness and everything this man has gone through that I felt it, I almost felt a degree of, of grief about leaving the film. I don't know if you ever feel oh, that Oh, wow. Way, where at the end of a film, you feel... It, it almost feels like a loss that you're not going to be sharing a character's or a, a real person's space anymore, you know? Yeah, and like, and you can never have the experience of watching it for the first time again, that kind of feeling? Uh, I mean, yeah, that, I mean, I think that's definitely part of it, too. Um, uh, I think it was. it's largely just that I feel like this person's life is going to continue, and we as the audience are probably not going to be a part of it anymore. And that, I don't know, that made me a little sad. I, I feel that sometimes oh, with, wow. with, with fictional films, too, you know, where I'm like... I'm glad that a movie has an endpoint, and mm-hmm. I think in general we don't need sequels. And I like I like at the end where we're basically we are just seeing a snapshot of this life. But there are times when I feel some maybe something akin to grief about the fact that that this character or this person is out of my life. Basically, I at, love that. Yeah. That's really great. <laughs> I feel like that is just what filmmakers should be aspiring to. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> 
All right, so we've got for you on Film Club this week, we've got more coverage of the Sundance Film Festival on avclub.com. Also, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to Film Club wherever you get your podcasts. This week's episode of Film Club was hosted by me, Alex Dowd, and by Katie Reif. It was produced and edited by Carl Blomberg. Our sound mixer and finishing editor is Seth Hafer, and our motion graphics designer is Julie Mullins. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Thanks. Bye. Bye.